few days ago at the United Nations, the General Assembly made a decision which has been widely acknowledged as the most important in its history. The decision was to admit the representatives of the government of Mao Zedong as representatives of China and to expel the representatives of the government of Chiang Kai-shek who had represented China for 22 years. The ambassador of the President of the United States in the United Nations fought for a compromise. He was willing to admit the representatives of Mao Zedong to the Security Council exclusively and to the General Assembly, but not exclusively. He insisted that the government of Taiwan owned a seat in the General Assembly representing 15 odd million Chinese who are not subservient to mainland China. He lost, we lost, in a vote so dramatic that it has been interpreted as the crystallization within the United Nations of a working anti-American majority. Here to discuss the implications of that vote are the American ambassador, Mr. Bush, and the chief of the Taiwan Chinese Information Service, Mr. Yi Cheng Lo. Mr. Bush was appointed ambassador to the UN last spring. He is a conspicuously talented human being, a son of a United States senator from Connecticut, expatriate to Texas, graduate of Andover and Yale Navy, fighter pilot shot down during the war in the China Sea, decorated captain of a baseball team, entrepreneur in the oil business, congressman from Texas, narrowly defeated senatorial candidate from Texas. Mr. Gene Lo is a graduate of National Cheng Chi University in Nanking, with a graduate degree in journalism at Columbia University, a veteran of two wars who received the Medal of Freedom from the United States government for his work in Korea. For almost 10 years, he has made the case for nationalist China as chief information officer, and finally last Monday, he lost. I should like to begin by asking Ambassador Bush the preliminary question, are you at liberty to disclose the exact nature of your instructions from President Nixon? Yes, sir. Um, our instructions were to execute, carry out uh, to the fullest degree the policy of dual representation. And this envisaged, as you said in the preamble, uh, represent affirming representation for the People's Republic in the United Nations and uh, in affirming the continued representation uh, of the Republic of China. Uh, inherent in these instructions was battling against the very dangerous precedent of expulsion, uh, something that the United Nations had not done, something that our opponents uh, said wasn't happening, though the word expel was used because they were maintaining that we were talking about restoration of the legal rights and thus it wasn't expulsion. And so uh, we were, I was uh, instructed to um, execute this policy as best we could. I well now when, when uh, people talk as they have in the last few days about your steamrolling tactics, what, what do they have in mind? Well, some talk about steamrolling, and now, ironically, uh, um, as of this very weekend, why uh, some are saying we didn't steamroll enough. Kind of a spongy and, steamroller, wasn't it? Well, it was, an arm twisting. I wish that I could say on the air when uh, General Romulo called me over and said, uh, uh, I said, well, I hope you don't uh, aren't concerned about these stories of uh, arm twisting, and he used a beautiful Texas expression to explain twisting. He said, well, we need to do uh, more of it. I must refrain from saying what it was, but there was some accused us of, of uh, arm twisting, others accused us of uh, now in the wake of what I consider a, uh, a defeat, frankly, for the United Nations, uh, of not doing enough. What we tried to do was forcefully represent the position of the United States government, of our many co-sponsors, of the Japanese, the countries that are uh, very closely affected by this decision, the peripheral countries of Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Philippines, Thailand, forcefully, all of us, forcefully representing these positions to, with what I felt was a high sense of advocacy, uh, and I hope honor, 
uh, to other countries. We started off, of course, with many of our staunchest allies against us, and they remained against us. But uh, I need to know what a definition of arm twisting is, because we, we, uh, we advocated the policy. I happen to believe in it. I happen to strongly feel that it would made sense for the United Nations. I happen to feel that it was the only way that re the Republic of China would continue to be represented in the United Nations. And I believe strongly, my problem was I believed our policy, Mr. Buckley. And uh, if that's arm twisting by talking to forcefully the small delegates about it, uh, delegations, uh, I, I would must plead guilty. But in terms, some felt that maybe we should have uh, uh, threatened or said, well, if you don't do this, we're going to curtail aid. We didn't do that. And uh, uh, that's, I suppose, uh, open to debate as to what, uh, whether we should have conducted ourselves differently. But we, we conducted a very forceful campaign. The president was keenly interested in it personally. And the secretary of state had some 90 consultations, so it practically horse up here, uh, trying to get this across. And there was work in capitals. And the other thing I'd like to say before concluding a answer that turned into a speech is that is that uh, uh, this work went on in capitals, and it went on not just by the United States, but by many, many other countries who are close allies of the Republic of China. Uh, Mr. Lowe, may I ask you, is it your impression or the impression of your government uh, that the United States work less diligently than it might have to avoid the result you deplore? I certainly uh, do not get the impression from Ambassador Bush's uh, hard work. I want to take this opportunity, sir, to uh, say that uh, we deeply appreciate the in effort of Ambassador Bush and the entire United States mission that, that uh, uh, in this uh, la past few weeks. Well, let me ask you this. If you had been President of the United States, could you have devised supplementary policies that have might have made the steamroller more effective? I wish I were, but I can't answer. <laughs> That's too hypothetical for me, Bill. Uh, in other words, uh, you, you, you are willing then to, uh, to accept the verdict of the United Nations as more or less historically determined as something that was outside, uh, outside the power of the United States to forestall? Uh, no, this is not what I mean. What I mean is just, uh, we, the Chinese, have a, a philosophy, and it is that we do our best, and then we leave the rest to uh, uh, whatever the powers that be uh, up above. We uh, believe that we've done a good fight. We believe many of our friends have put in a good fight. There are different uh, uh, assessments of whether that fight could have been more effective or less effective. But uh, after the vote Monday night, we feel that this is time for us to look forward and not to look backward. Backward. This is no time at all to apportion blame. I don't we think ourselves. Don't think a little recrimination can be useful sometimes. <laughs> I mean, that's what Nuremberg was all about, wasn't it? Uh, that was uh, in the case of Nuremberg. But uh, we would like, uh, in the traditional Chinese philosophy, to shoulder all responsibilities ourselves. Well, now, I've heard it said that if it had not been for Mr. Nixon's initiative uh, in Peking last July, uh, the vote would have gone substantially as it went anyway. Would you agree with that prediction or not? Oh, personally, yes, I think it has a lot to do with the entire change of atmosphere at the United Nations. Oh, you misunderstood me. I said it has been said that if Mr. Nixon hadn't gone to, uh, hadn't sent Mr. Kissinger to China at all, it wouldn't have affect, would not have affected the vote, i.e. that it was in the cards. You were referring to Mr. Kissinger's second visit. Uh, or, or, or the whole uh, announcement. The, the July one. Because, yeah. yes, the but July let's, yeah, let's, one. Let's take the July one. The July one, of course, this is what, uh, this is, let's face it, this is what caused the entire shift. The United States has done a 180 degree uh, shift in its positions, and this uh, naturally affected the decision of other countries. Did it affect it critically? Critically, yes. Mr. Ambassador, would you agree? No, I wouldn't say that the, the that it, let me start arguing, uh, stop by saying that it could have had some effect, but I wouldn't say critically. And the reason I say that is that last year, the Albanian resolution got 51, uh, won by 51 to 49. Uh, we were able, uh, as my friend knows, to, with the support of other allies, to uphold the important question, the, what we call the non-expulsion resolution. 
and thus forestall the expulsion of the Republic of China. And I believe these numbers are correct, but subsequent to last year's vote, I believe that 12 different countries established relations with the Peking and broke off relations with the Republic of China. And inherent in those relationships were, um, inherent in those relationships was the recognition that Peking was the sole legitimate government. So my own view is, is if there had not been a shift, and this isn't exactly on the point, Bill, but if there had not been a shift in policy to envisage both being in the United Nations, the effort would have been destined to, to uh, failure from the very beginning. It was difficult to attract co-sponsors uh, in preliminary diplomatic initiatives without a recognition that the People's Republic of China uh, should have, affirm, have their representation affirmed. Now, I'm not sitting here saying there was no effect. I am saying that I'm, I, I don't think that, the, uh, that this will, um, is the decisive effect, although certainly some could argue that it started a race for Peking and who wants to get there first and we would be hurt. But I, I, I think given the numbers from last year that the, the, we adopted the only realistic policy, uh, trip or no trip, that would keep the Republic of China in the United Nations. We did not succeed in it. But that I have a slight difference with my friend on this particular point. Well, would you go so far as to say that the uh, position, that the, to the extent that the government in Taiwan uh, adopted the same position as the Red Chinese, i.e. that Taiwan was a part of China, uh, it made theoretically difficult the, 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 the position you were attempting yes, sir. to promote. It, it made it very difficult, but we felt, and this did not get through, our policy was continued to be called a two-China policy, when technically it wasn't. We did not juridically try to solve this uh, dispute that, that exists as to who is the legitimate government, and we felt that we gave those, even those that had recognized Peking, uh, leeway to support our position. But we felt that this, without trying to solve this thing once and for all, leaving the door open on it, simply saying, here's a reality, here's another reality, that we were, we were leaving, we thought we would give people who were negotiating with Peking, who had established relations with Peking, flexibility. It proved not to be, uh, uh, some were, you know, simply said, well, you can't be serious about this, and, and this was a factor there. And Mr. Lowe's government made this difficult for you? No, Mr. Lowe's government, uh, I must say, uh, well, difficult only in that they couldn't, th th no, they made it not difficult on dual representation. The very fact there was this broad uh, division, uh, you see, my, uh, made it difficult, but that, we weren't asking them to resolve that problem. Uh, there was some um, feeling in the United Nations of, of that, well, the U.S. can't be serious about this. I will admit that. We tried to argue very hard through uh, a lot of diplomatic initiative, and plus this non-juridical concept that we were desperately serious about two things. One, retaining the seat for the Republic of China, and two, uh, the precedent of expulsion, battling against that. Uh, so, um, I, I don't think they made it difficult for us. In fact, I think history will show that once the policy was set, they were extremely cooperative and I've had high-level representations extremely grateful for the energies expended and for the work done, and, and they did a lot of diplomatic work themselves. They had certainly had some uh, home consumption problems that, that made uh, uh, the frankest disclosure possible, uh, difficult. Well, Mr. Lowe, um, don't, don't you suppose that there must have been some, uh, 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 let's assume that there are a few countries in the United Nations that interest themselves in uh, principle. Uh, wouldn't you wouldn't you suppose that uh, they were baffled by the fact that your claims and those of Red China were exactly equal on the point that there ought to be a single representative for the twin areas, and that you therefore might have played into the hands uh, of of the enemy as a result of pursuing that point? It only appears on the surface uh, baffling, but uh, I think that uh, we. Uh, explained it very this very very clearly to all the con all our friendly countries in the UN uh, you uh, you realize as well as everyone else that uh, even after we walked out of the uh, general assembly monday night 
uh, there's still 35 countries who voted for us. It's, uh, it's, they could very well have jumped on the bandwagon. It's, it was a futile uh, uh, exercise for them to vote against it, but I think they stick to principles. And uh, I do not think any of these, or even some of the others, had any misunderstanding in their mind as to exactly where my country stood. And um, in this you, regard, I think... to principles when you, when you had urged them to, to, uh, to take the position that, a, that uh, Taiwan and China is a single entity and under the circumstances ought to be represented by a single government. That becomes then a choice of your government or the communist government. Now, aren't they saying, well, we would prefer it if, the, if Mr. Lowe's government would permit us to think of them as two entities, but since you excluded that, didn't well, logic drive Well, them? let me put it this way. Diplomacy, some said, is the art to uh, agree on disagree, uh, on disagree on the thing. And uh, I think we, there's, there had been no difficulty when we made our position clear to these governments on the one hand because of our constitutional requirement because of the uh, uh, standing national policy of government, we cannot ourselves uh, agree, for example, with the due, res due representation policy, but we would understand uh, if the other governments, uh, for uh, reasons that, uh, of, uh, that they would like to see us continue to be represented in the United Nations. I think that was made quite clear, as the ambassador has pointed out. I don't think there ever was any uh, confusion in any, any of the chief delegates' mind as to uh, where we stand in the first place and what would be the possible result or the other. Okay, uh, Mr. Bush, let me ask you this then. Uh, uh, now, you, you, you say that as regards uh, uh, expulsion, a very dangerous precedent uh, uh, has been set. Do you understand the United Nations to have embarked on a new doctrinal course or do you think historians will interpret the events of the last few days as being primarily, as signifying primarily a shift in the relationships of power, uh, which makes the parliamentary aspect really meaningless, but the existential uh, aspect of, of considerable strategic importance? It's too early to tell. Certainly, <coughs> right now, it's going to be viewed as this shift in power. Uh, we were deadly serious when we were talking about the precedent of expulsion. Just in the paper yesterday morning, a few, few days ago, I read some, and I don't know to the degree of this man's responsibility or irresponsibility, uh, representing a, a, an Arab group, suggesting, hooray, the precedent is set so these people that don't abide by the UN resolutions can be thrown out by 50%. History will tell whether anybody's going to execute this, but we wanted to guard against this. And uh, we did not get through to our friends and allies. We made the most, and because they were saying, we're not dealing with expulsion. As Mr. Lowe knows, we're dealing with the restoration of the lawful rights. Please don't talk about expulsion. You're confusing things, Ambassador Bush, by discussing this. Mm -hmm. The Secretary of State made a very a uh, strong statement about this precedent of expulsion. And our great friends in Europe, with whom we happen to disagree very strongly on this, were saying, look, you know you're just throwing up a smoke screen. We weren't. We believe it. So I think, it, I think uh, Bill, history is going to tell whether, whether we were just going through the motions. But there's, there's an emotional atmosphere in the UN. And uh, uh, to, it, Monday night, it was, it was the Republic of China. They can call it something else. We call it expulsion. Uh, some other night, it could be South Africa, given the emotion of the place. Some other night, and I, you know, you go right down the, the list. So we were battling against the precedent of expulsion. Well, history will answer sure. that question. I, I grant that history will, but in a, in a sense, that is a a, a, a cop Thank out, you. isn't it? But we 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 we've got to give history a helping a, a hand. Now, uh, well, for, I hope for, we'll be smart instance. enough not to not to do this, sure. not to not to exercise this this precedent that's uh -huh. been set. Well, now, w would, would you, is this safe to say that if tomorrow the majority of the Assembly of the United Nations were to vote to say that uh, in as much as it has acted on the subject, uh, any power, uh, any nation that maintained a separate embassy in Taiwan was doing so in defiance of the findings of the General Assembly and therefore was itself subject to uh, expulsion. Now, it would be preposterous, A, that it should do that, or B, that you would pay attention to it if it did. 
well, certainly the last two things are true, and I can hardly see anybody saying that a representation in the UN prevents people from having whatever bilateral relations they want. Uh, Germany, for example, is not represented in the United Nations. Switzerland's not represented, and nobody has yet raised the question. So I would hope that nobody would uh, carry this example that far. Well, but suppose Red China, having been seated, uh, insists that our military presence in Taiwan is an act of aggression on a territory that is juridically theirs by vote of the United Nations. What do you do? Well, what we do is Are you say, look, to hell or what? we phrase it more diplomats. That's when I was a politician, I would have phrased it. Now I'm an instant diplomat, and I'd phrase it very differently. But I would say, look, the President of the United States has said he's going to uphold his commitments, and please don't discuss this any further. We are going to uphold our commitments to the Republic of China. Next subject, please, sir. Yes, but suppose they say, uh, uh, much as we'd like to oblige you, we will not change the subject. We are going to press for the logical extension of the policies that were voted uh, uh, in October. And the logical extension is that Americans, Americans have no right to have military forces on Chinese territory. I can how do you defend yourself in a situation like that? How do you well, defend us? Well, we would simply argue that our bilateral relations are our bilateral relations, and if this is the policy of the United States government, this will be the policy of the United well, States government. And I don't see that they, you know, they can pass a lot of resolutions over there that, uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, some could suggest would, would bind. And one of the problems at the UN is that when a motion prevails, there's, there's a tendency there to talk about uh, uh, punitive action that will commit countries to war and this kind of thing. And that fortunately hasn't happened very much. But uh, you're posing a hypothetical problem where, to which I don't know the, the, the intermediate action there, but I know the final answer, and that is that the United States government would not stand for that. This, and the this, president uh, has made that clear. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I suppose they said we, we want bilateral relations with the state of Kansas. We, we, we obviously would not permit that, would we? No, we would not. No, well, we the, would. The, 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 the point, the reason I say that is because they are, I should think, now in a position under the rubric of the recent decision to press the cl claims against us, which would be equivalent to our claims against them if they were all of a sudden, as I say, to start relations with Kansas or, or Hawaii, if you want to make it geographically more uh, uh, plausible. Yeah. Now, uh, are, are you really saying, in effect, that the United Nations, by its vote last Monday, has really stitched itself into uselessness because they have invited, uh, they have invited impasse, and having done so, necessarily they will go into desuetude. No, I can't say that it's uselessness because I, in spite of the uh, what I think was a major step backwards, not only in the precedent but in the uh, the treatment of decent people, uh, and this troubled me, and it was called glee. The, 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 something much more transcended glee. Um, uh, in spite of this, and in spite of my deep personal involvement and regret, and our country's uh, concern about the fact that the US, UN took a step backwards, I can't say that this one action alone makes it a useless organization, because I think there are things there that are to the interests of every citizen in the United States to support. And, and so I, wouldn't, I would hope that this would not be history's... Uh, well, let, let me ask you this, though, Mr. Bush. Uh, your, your background um, uh, has always led you to abide by parliamentary majorities, right? When, when you won the vote in Texas, you went to Congress. When you lost it, you didn't go to the Senate. Uh, when you were elected to something and captain of the baseball team, you took office. <laughs> if you hadn't been, you would not have taken office. Now, uh, what is the purpose of a vote? in the United Nations, a vote in which you participate, if it isn't a vote which you are willing to observe, ob observe the majority dictate of? Well, we're, we're willing to ob observe the majority dictate that Peking uh, be seated and with great regret that the Republic of China be expelled. And that's it. That's what we're willing to observe. But the implications uh, of that vote, surely, are that Taiwan is a province of China. And you are not accepting the implications of that no. vote unless you therefore proceed to discharge the ambassador from Taiwan and accept one from Peking. Are you? No, we will not go that far. We are going to retain our 
rights to conduct our diploma we are not assigning away all sovereignty to the united nations this is not a hallmark of our policy nor in my view should it be but when, united nations, it when we can when the night united nations tells you to boycott uh, rhodesia you boycott rhodesia right well or is it only because it happens to coincide with our policy if, if so why didn't you do it ahead of time i think I think in the final analysis, the United States is going to have to reserve unto itself its, as just as every other country does there, its major uh, policy mm. decisions. And this one has been determined by the president, and this one I'm convinced he won't waver from because of an unfortunate ac action that we, with which we disagree. Well, Mr. Lowe, as you know, for, for 10 or 15 years, the so-called uh, Holstein Doctrine prevailed in Europe the terms of which were that West Germany would not recognize any government which recognized East Germany. Will you come forward with an equivalent of that, i.e., will you refuse to recognize any country that recognizes the Mao Zedong government in China? It has been our policy in the past. How about the future? The future, I do not know, but I think Don't it is... tell us that history will decide. Uh, that, <laughs> no, but uh, I think uh, it's like the UN, uh, like the UN situation. I'm somewhat relieved after the uh, strange, see, after the Monday night vote, because uh, it solved a dilemma for, for us. Because what? Because it solved a dilemma for us. We didn't have to choose. Uh, we were uh, voted out, so we uh, walked out before the vo vote took place. But you're going to have And to this was now. the same thing. <clears throat> Canada, for example, started from a two-China policy. And in uh, 19 or 20 month negotiation with the Chinese communists, the Chi uh, Mao insisted it could only be a one China policy, so uh, Canada uh, switched. And this is the case with all the countries that has so far tried to recognize uh, uh, Peking. Uh, Mr. Trudeau started by thinking he was doing Chinese communists a favor by recognizing him. Later on, he found out that he had to beg them to accept his recognition. And he has to swallow his pride and uh, swallow the uh, uh, whatever condition that Mao has given him. And that condition has been that they must sever all relations with us, not only diplomatic, but also it's uh, also trade, also everything. It was, it was made even clear that uh, they could not even allow this, the remaining of a trade delegation of us. So I think this problem, problem would not come up <laughs> at all. Isn't there, isn't there, I'd like, if, is it appropriate yes, for me, sir. Uh, isn't there a flexibility in some of the formula that have been adopted, uh, such as in the Cameroons and Kuwait on this, though? Haven't they been less rigid as they uh, establish or approach the establishment of diplomatic relations with Peking? And in, in, in other words, haven't they tried to leave the door open to a presence in their countries of both the Republic of China and the uh, People's Republic or not? What is the flexibility? Isn't there, haven't they been pressing for a flexibility that will get away from the point that Mr. Buckley was just talking about? We've had many uh, friendly countries, including the United States, that uh, urge us to be more flexible. And uh, it's uh, the policy now is to adopt a case by case basis. I do not know about Kuwait. I believe our embassy was closed. Yes, On the insistence of the Chinese communists. No, I, I just thought the formula under which these negotiations were maybe maybe in that case it it turned out to be the same old formula but in my view uh in my recognition re recollection i think that some of these formula were negotiated so there is a flexibility under which both can exist i guess it hasn't happened yet but i had a feeling that your government was demonstrating some flexibility there where in the past there uh, there had or was encouraging flexibility there where in the past it had not been not been able to do that Mr. Agnew calls squishy thought. Well, <laughs> as, I, as I say, we uh, haven't, uh, it, uh, we, yes, we were willing to uh, be, we were uh, probing all sort of possibilities. We were, uh, uh, we have uh, encouraged the uh, continuance of trade relations, expanding trade relations with many countries which broke with us in the past. Uh, I Is just read. Is there any country uh, in the world in, in which you and Peking have an ambassador? No, mm -hmm. not that I'm, I'm aware of. Uh, would you but uh, uh, Cam I just, today, I just read this morning that Canada, for example, after they broke with us last year, our trade with Canada jumped 74% since 1970. Uh, so we are doing all sorts of things to try to promote bilateral relations, to expand trade, to expand economic contact. And I'm very glad to report that uh, our economic uh, muscles seem to be paying off.
think that showed in the African vote where you got 50 percent of the African countries on the important question vote, which was, yes. it demonstrated that they had reached out, they'd been constructive uh, uh, citizens of the world trying to help people, and s some remembered it. Yes, not only that, but among the 35 that stuck with us to the end, 15 of these are from Africa. Well, it, it's, it's true, isn't it, that there's a certain hostility among uh, certain nations in Africa as a result of uh, certain practices of the Chinese communists that might, that might have contributed to that. No question. It, uh, it, it must have had, yes, yeah, of course. Yeah. All right. Well, now, let, let me ask you this, uh, uh, Mr. Bush. Uh, as, as you project the situation in terms of the future uh, of the United Nations, do, 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 you, do you believe that um, the instrument, the, the instrument of, of expulsion has now has now become so easy that it is going to be the way by which the UN typically chooses to exercise sanctions. Uh, I would hope not, because many of the people that voted against us, particularly our European allies, our uh, NATO uh, allies, uh, Britain uh, would be one that immediately came to mind, uh, would argue that they weren't dealing with expulsion and thus would we would have many people shift over if the question can. In other words, I don't think you can take the important question vote simply as uh, those who are, who are on this expulsion theme uh, because many of the Nordic countries and others would vehemently argue that they weren't expelling something. It said expel. And this is what troubled me. It says expel. Uh, but then they say, oh, yeah, but it says expel the representatives of Chiang Kai-shek. It did not dignify them by calling them a government. And uh, we feel the precedent was there. These other countries would join us, however, in arguing that no, uh, whatever the next case might be, expulsion by a 50% majority is wrong. Well, if, if therefore somebody moved for the uh, expulsion of, say, South Africa, Mm -hmm. uh, your, your feeling is that, uh, that however loathsome its policies were to, to a lot of people, Same they would simply decline to expel it, uh, to decline well, to use this as a sanction. I think we would argue, and I, think, I hope with some effect, that this would be a um, Chapter 6 thing that would have to go first through the Security Council and then two-thirds in the General Assembly, whereas on trying to argue that on the other one, uh, simply didn't work because you had a parliamentary body that saw fit to say this was not expulsion. Today, our strongest allies won't recognize that we were legitimately arguing the question of expulsion. We were. We believed it. And uh, we simply could not get that across. Because of bilateral commitments, I believe Mr. Lewitt agree that it had been uh, sought out or thrust upon uh, others who were with us on many other important issues. Well, let me ask you then, Mr. Lowe, uh, is, is it conceivable that um, your government could move formally to, in order to regularize the juridical situation, to secede from China, uh, proceed with a plebiscite that approved that secession uh, under international law, uh, provided, uh, provided a part of a nation uh, can succeed in its secession uh, in the way that, for instance, Biafra did not succeed, uh, it becomes entitled to de facto recognition. Would you consent to going through those steps in order to assert uh, a claim for re-inclusion uh, into the UN? No, uh, I cannot conceive that such a course would ever be uh, taken by the Chinese government. Uh, for the, uh, there, there are two levels of argument against it. The first is we always say that we are Chinese. We, we always agree with the uh, communist regime that there is only one Chinese nation. There's only one China. And secondly, uh, uh, any that thought of... that by the way? <laughs> yes, we, but however, with the important proviso that after the Tibetan uprising, our president went on record in a, in a formal statement that once Tibet, uh, the Tibetan people would be free to exercise their own free will, the government will abide by their wish, even if they want self-determination. This is the difference. Well, why wouldn't the government abide by the wish of Formosa? to become independent? No, because, it all, so because all the government is Chinese. And secondarily, it's, uh, as, I, as I was, I was uh, saying, it uh, wouldn't be practical 
for us to uh, reapply as a, as a, as a separate uh, country for the very simple reason the new membership must receive approval of the Security Council. And with the Chinese Communist regime sitting in the Security Council, I think it's, <laughs> it's a foregone conclusion. It will simply be There's absolutely deterred. no possibility. We wouldn't even think of such a thing. Ms. Trevis. That's you, isn't it? Yes, that's me. <laughs> um, Mr. Bush, I think I agree uh, with Mr. Lowe that, um, that the real issue in the UN was a credentials fight between two sets of contending representatives, both saying that they represented all of the people of China. Um, there are the, Did the, I say that? that? Well, you said that you, your government claims to represent all of the people of China. Yes. Is that true? Right. And uh, I think that, also that the uh, it, yes. Peking says the same thing. So I think I, I kind of agree with you on that. Um, as far as I know, there are the same number of states in the United Nations now as they were about a week ago. Hasn't the question um, of expulsion then uh, been raised only in relation to South Africa uh, in the United Nations, which has uh, repeatedly refused to comply with all of the United Nations directives regarding apartheid in that country, and can you name other states uh, who are now afraid of expulsion? Well, I mentioned an example, which I hope was an extreme example, uh, in the state of Israel, which was brought up not by us and not by an official government organization, but by a uh, pro professed, and I'm going to be very careful here not to accord the man more, uh, more stature than he deserves uh, in, in, in relation to Israel. But you see, uh, where you and I differ, is that, is that there, are two, there are two existing realities there. There are two existing realities. This government, governments, they've reached out to all over. They have uh, into helping other countries. They, they're there, they're real, and they're not some, they're not some uh, individuals representing somebody. I mean, uh, they're a legitimate government that's lived within the framework of nations uh, constructively for a long, long, long time. Our country was prepared to say uh, that, that, that Peking is a reality, too. So this is why we didn't uh, subscribe to the view of a credentials fight. We left open the question. We said if the UN is going to be more realistic, yes, it makes some sense to have a quarter, th quarter of the world's population represented. We believed that. That was one part of it. And the other part was that we don't believe the price tag ought to be the expulsion of an existing reality. No matter what you or I or the Europeans think of the credentials. They're both viable, independent realities. And this was the point that we obviously didn't get across, uh, but it's the point that we rem I remain convinced of it. So it's, that's where you and I differ. Mr. Cooper. Yeah, um, Mr. Bush, um, you spoke before about, um, about arm twisting. And you, you then mentioned um, talking, talking forcefully as, as, as somehow characteristic of, of the way um, that you had been accused of, of arm twisting. Now, in light of, in light of Nixon and, and Rogers' veiled threats, and today very much more substantive threats to withdraw <coughs> funds from the UN, uh, of which um, Mr. Buckley's brother is a is a sponsor of, of that resolution Delicate before. Delicate sponsor, please. <laughs> oh, right. I will even I will even grant you that um, is a sponsor in our Senate uh, of a, of a bill before our Senate at the moment. Um, in addition to the fact that there were that there were reports um, that the U.S. had threatened to withdraw aid from small member nations of the UN. That's not if true. They, all right. Um, well, in light of this resolution before I'll just sort of get it out the Senate, of the way, so we. Isn't isn't that isn't that you know quite a bit like uh, like a rich child who strikes out at bat and then picks up his batting ball and, and and goes home and breaks up the game? That's not what we're going to do. But may I ask a clarifying question? You must have later information than I. What was the reference that was reinforced today that you made well, in threat? Well, I heard because on the radio this, this morning as I was as I was brushing my teeth yeah. <laughs> um, that um, that indeed there there were you know that 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 these kinds of things were being talked about today in a more serious yeah. way than they, than they had been yeah. I think they this had is an, I think example. this is an understandable uh, expression. Now, you call it arm twisting. I, would, I, would I don't call it arm twisting. I say forceful diplomacy. I arm would twisting call it blackmail. Mean, well, this did not go... You, you know, we got, maybe we've got to start over. One, we did not blackmail anybody. Two, we did not threaten anybody. Some feel we might. We should have. We did not do that. Three, we have not talked about recrimination or reprisal against the United Nations. 
four, the secretary re reinforced or restated his and our government's uh, support. And so please read what the President of the United States has said on this subject, not what is implied. And I recognize that's difficult because I went back having seen the story about what was attributed to the President of the United States, and it simply, in my view, was an inaccurate interpretation of what Ziegler said several days ago at the press conference. There has been no threat. Now, let's not deceive ourselves. There is an understandable concern in the United States about the action taken by the United Nations. The, but the President and the Secretary of State and the much lesser, degree, lesser importance, this ambassador, have not threatened, have not indicated in any way retaliation, have not supported any move to, to, that would appear to do just what you're concerned about, picking up the bat and ball to go home. Because in spite of our tremendous disappointment, I see things that, that we must support in the United Nations. So I, I'm pleased you asked that, and I, I hope I'm not twisting your arm by forcefully uh, laying to rest what has been a mysterious myth ever since the United States embarked on a policy we strongly believed in. And it's been one I've had to shoot down. There's, this UN is the darndest rumor factory you've ever seen. And this was one of them. The U.S. is twisting arms. And I want somebody to describe what it means. Give me an example. Well, I, I, mean, I, I did invited. offer, I mean, I mean, there is a bill before the Senate right now, or, or an amendment to the foreign aid bill. Or surely you're not suggesting like that, that senators should be muzzled and not express themselves. This is not about all I want to say. <laughs> no, I'm saying this is not the policy of the United States government. We've got to separate out what is the, the government policy and what is the expression of the people. And this I could never get across across the street. And please look at these statements made by the President and the Secretary, because this is, this is our policy. I expect Mr. Buckley might argue with it, but this is the policy. I'm always impressed by today's youth always seem to apply double standards. Let me ask this gentleman, back, Mr. Cooper, back, uh, back in, the, in the late 1950s, when Communist China want, wanted to monopolize the second Bandung Conference, which is supposed to hold at Algier, and then when uh, they could not block the Russians from getting there. They could not get what they want. They uh, simply torpedoed the whole Second Bandung Conference. Would you call that blackmail? Mm, I'm, I just am not well acquainted enough with, with the facts. You don't have to be. You, you don't have to be acquainted with them at all. Well, well I think call, I do to have to make a I thought you represented hey, so concerned Asian scholars, if that's the case. Uh, Asia is your specialty, isn't it? Well, it is. It, that's true. <laughs> I'm an anthropologist by trade. No, but the, uh, if I might go back to the, the, the arm twisting, please, there has not been the threats in these things we're accused of. I, I remember one, uh, uh, one uh, editorial that occurred that accused me of smoke room politics by a very distinguished uh, editor, Mr. Reston. And I'm going to see him and ask him what it is he means, because we tried to conduct ourselves, and maybe it was too, uh, maybe it was too, uh, sportsmanlike, I don't know, but we did it forcefully, and we made very clear it was, in our view, to the interest of the United Nations, and we made it very clear we thought this policy was to the interest of the United States government. And beyond that, I don't. I think if you can't represent your government with a sense of advocacy in these halls, why uh, you're not serving the people, you're not serving the UN itself well. So it's here that we have a difference, Ms. Frank. Um, I'd like to ask Ambassador Bush. Um, if the United States felt justified in ignoring 700 million Chinese for over 20 years, why is it now deploring the loss of representation of 14 million on Taiwan, leaving aside the question of whether or not the people of Taiwan are really represented by their government? Well, the two, it seems to me the question without being critical, is a little unrelated. One, we were affirming representation for Peking uh, for various reasons I'd be glad to go into. But two, the question of continuing. We never wavered in our uh, desire to have the Republic of China stay in. No, no, and no, no, three, no, you misunderstood her. She says, she says, look, we went 19 years <coughs> saying we're not going to recognize the reality of Mao Zedong governing okay. China. Why should we be so shocked when only five days where the United Nations is adopting a similar position as regards Formosa. If we can ignore the de facto situation there, why can't they ignore the de facto situation there? Well, because we think there have been changes in terms of Peking's uh, 
desire to come into the UN, Peking's uh, establishment reaching out to the world in terms of diplomatic relations. Peking's not What's saying. Changed? Well, Peking saying well, what's at one point. What's different between a year ago when we opposed Peking coming in well, and today? Well, what's different there is a very pragmatic difference, and that is that no longer could the representation of the Republic of China be preserved for one thing, plus the fact that we've had a major shift in our policy, which is seeks more communication with the People's Republic of China. But the point that I, I think we were getting off on is this: is the kind of the degree of democracy of the Republic of China, and I'm not sure that it's our. Uh, if we started, uh, if we started uh, kind of uh, analyzing, you know, the freedom of elections in every one of the 131 nations in the UN, if we were to be the judges of their degree of democracy or their degree of participation, I expect we'd have a rather small number of countries over there instead of 131. And this was the point. Maybe I did misunderstand the question, but I believe was that is that responsive to part of your question or not? Um, I I'm was more interested in the, as Mr. Buckley yeah. pointed out, in the question of. Um, the United States feeling that there was nothing wrong in the people of mainland China not being represented, whereas it does feel that it's wrong that the people of Taiwan are no longer represented. This switch in policy. Yeah. Well, I think I think there had been changes that I mentioned, and I think that the uh, from a practical UN standpoint, believing in the retention of the Republic of China, uh, had we had no desire, had the president not move forward towards communication with Peking. Please accept my judgment, and I'd like to know, Mr. Lowe's, whether there would have been any chance at all to sustain the status quo at the UN. My judgment is that it wouldn't, because the Albanian resolution having passed last year, uh, and with the shift in diplomatic relations since then, whether we shifted our policy on Peking or not, I'm convinced that the status quo would not have been retained. But That's I, what <coughs> is, isn't this fair to say, uh, uh, Mr. Lowe and, 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 and George, isn't this fair to say that our position has been that the, the Mao Zedong government was an imposter government, point one, and point two, that its activities did not qualify it for membership under the criteria specified in the charter, pure and simple. And what happened in the last year isn't that we consider it less of an imposter government. We have no reason at all to suppose that the 700 million people are being represented by the, by the, by the guy that Mao Zedong is going to send over here next week. On the contrary, we have every reason to suppose that he's sending over here somebody who is dis distinctly the enemy of the people. After all, they have to kill two or three percent of them every year, just to keep in mind. Uh, but we simply say we, we, are li we are living with the situation. There's nothing we can do about it. They continue to stand in the books of the United Nations as an aggressor, but things, you just got to get used to things. So, so, so the, uh, the original position isn't that we were denying representation to the 700 million people, but that the government that sought to represent, represent them had no legitimate grounds for doing so. And that there have been some quite obvious changes from the, from the, uh, from the uh, Cultural Revolution days in terms of their approach to the United Nations and their desirability of coming here. Our view was fine. It makes it more realistic at this point, and the president's uh, approach towards communication, certainly not acceptance of ideology, but to communication, I think has strong support here. But we simply didn't think that, the, that it ought to be done um, we thought the price tag was high. We thought it was being done on a, uh, uh, without reference to the, uh, uh, the realistic and, and frankly, law-abiding government that, that well, now so has been expelled. Well, why can't the United Nations say, well, we think the price tag is, is too high to ask us, in effect, to support uh, a mutiny on the part of the people in Formosa against the people of mainland China, and under the circumstances, we decline to acknowledge it. Well, I don't think we are in the position, want to be in the position, and will be in the position of uh, uh, doing anything except protecting the interests of the Republic of China under our existing commitments. As we seek relations and communication with Peking, we don't do it in an aggressive fashion. We simply say, here again, I keep going back to here are two realities, and uh, inside the UN, uh, it didn't work the way we wanted. Outside of the UN, we will uphold, the President has said, we will uphold our commitments to the Republic of China. If I may cut in here, Bill, yes, sir. the young lady uh, touched, uh, apparently proceeds from the philosophy that uh, the Chinese Communist regime represents the 700, uh, 700 million people on the mainland, and that my government does not represent the 14.8 uh, million people on, in, in Taiwan, which is incidentally is more than one, exactly 100, I counted, 
of the UN members in population. Uh, there is a working democratic system in Taiwan. Elections are held periodically. And also, I want to uh, uh, state this fact, which has perhaps escaped the young lady's uh, attention. Earlier this, uh, earlier this year in the show, the advocates that's broadcast over these same stations, our vice president, C.K. Yen, went on the record as saying, my government is prepared to hold a plebiscite in Taiwan as long as the Chinese Commerce government also agrees to hold a plebiscite on the mainland to decide which Chinese government they prefer. And I think until our offer, which is standing one, is taken up and put to a test, I don't think anyone could even allege that there is lack of popular support in Taiwan for our government. Ms. Travis. Yes. Um, isn't, it, isn't it true, though, Mr. Lo, on, on the same point, that um, the central government of Taiwan is composed of legislative, of a body similar to our legislative, judicial, and yes. executive branches, which include represent, proportional representation from not only Taiwan, but from all the provinces of China, yes. leaving Taiwan a very, very small voice in the conduct of, of such matters as international affairs and, and as the UN question and so forth. I understand that there is a provincial government, but as far yes. as the central government's policies, is that not the yes. case? Yes, you've done your homework, homework <laughs> well, but I do not know whether you realize that the year before last there was an additional supplementary election held in Taiwan to re-elect, uh, to, to, to add uh, local uh, representation on the national level, and that they are now studying means of, of further uh, en enlarging that representation. There have been many, many uh, plans that have been now studied, uh, the most dra from, a, from the most drastic one of scraping the uh, setup altogether, conduct a re-election, to uh, some modified ways of uh, uh, retaining a part but electing a re-electing a large part of it. We are very aware of this. We are, we are, the government is doing everything it could within the constitutional framework to uh, uh, give the uh, present population of Taiwan the largest possible participation in the government. This is, uh, this can be seen in many uh, aspects. There's, there's, uh, there's now 85% uh, of the uh, of the uh, employees and uh, uh, local governments are, are, are uh, native bonds, and then more than half, 50 percent in, in, in the national level are also uh, native bonds. But our government has the problem that we brought over the Chinese constitution from the mainland. We owe it to our people, our brethren, that includes my father, my brother, and my sister on the mainland, to return the same constitutional guarantees to them. And therefore, you cannot simply, when you claim con continuity, in the constitutional system. You cannot simply just uh, discard everything in the well, past. Uh, there was the uh, precedence, for example, when, uh, during the war, Mr. Churchill had to suspend elections in Britain until the war is won. Mr. Uh, Cooper. <coughs> yeah, um, I would wonder if you would, uh, I'd like to put you in, in the sights of my firing line, if you, if sure. you don't mind for a moment. Um, you spared, <coughs> excuse me, you spared no effort um, in whitewashing uh, Joe McCarthy's attacks on, on the supposed communists in, in our State Department in the early 1950s. No, I spared some effort. <laughs> well, all right. <laughs> At any rate, you were, you, were, you, were quite, you were quite vehement in, in, in your defense of McCarthy's attacks on the, on the alleged communists in, in our State Department, who were supposedly responsible for, for undermining our support of the Chiang Kai-shek regime in, in the post-World War II period and in the early 1950s. Mm -hmm. Now. Do you suppose that at, that at this point, uh, President Nixon, uh, himself uh, quite a capable advocate of, of the cause that, that you advocated in the 1950s, might, might be hiding some communists under his bed? And that, and that he has gone over to their cause? And that, and that it is the communists in, in, in President Nixon's regime who, have, who are responsible for the recent softening of America's China policy and, and for his projected trip to Peking? Oh, and if I not, mean. if not, don't you then feel that that might be cause to re-examine some of some of your theories about about the early 1950s? Which uh, about about the the reality of of communist infiltration of the State Department, and that perhaps there may have been there may have been other no. other kinds of factors involved no. in 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 be, the no, people be, who were because <coughs> because so X is caused by Y does not mean that X mightn't have been caused by Z. If that's the answer, that's the answer to your question uh, logically. 
uh, as regards uh, uh, the question, uh, is, is there a communist uh, uh, influence? The answer is, of course, manifest. Uh, the communist influence is extremely important. It's the kind of thing that causes us to subdue those distinctions uh, which, uh, uh, which, uh, uh, which are really quite stark. For instance, you get, uh, you get uh, Mr. Bush's distinguished predecessor, Francis Plimpton, standing up in the United Nations two or three years ago and says, uh, colonialism has ended in the world. Now, I, I can't imagine anybody saying that in the light of the fact that uh, there are 13 or 14 countries in the world which, if they don't do exactly what they're told to do by the Soviet Union, they get things like tanks running over them, mm -hmm. uh, uh, except that little by little, in the Orwellian sense, one becomes used <coughs> to the vocabulary of people who's, uh, who are communists and whose aim is to corrupt the vocabulary. All you have to do is sit 15 minutes in the United Nations uh, and listen to them talk about South Africa uh, as, as something that ought to be the gravamen of the world's complaints. You know, people who, s who, who step on the corpses of, hunt of, of, of tens of millions of, of, of people, and you understand that the communist influence is very, very considerable. Now you say, has it influenced Nixon? Of course it influences Nixon, in the sense that it influences reality. Mr. Nixon, as president of the United States, has to deal with the world as it is. The world as it is is a world which absolutely accepts as completely workaday the tyranny of the Soviet Union, the tyranny of Mao Zedong, and simply proceeds on the basis of what's wrong with the Negro situation in the South. Uh, Bilo Russia stands up and solemnly weighs the arguments and votes guests who win. <laughs> now, the fact that you and I can accept this so nonchalantly <coughs> means that we are definitely subject to communist influence, and I'm worried about you. Miss <laughs> 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 Frank. Um, <clears throat> I would like to answer <coughs> Mr. Law's... Answer? Or, or ask? Ask Mr. Law about um, his... Um, his government in view of the fact that since 1949 the Kuomintang government has maintained a state of national emergency in Taiwan and maintained the area under its control, the province of Taiwan, under martial law with the result that the government has suspended most of the guarantees and protections of individual rights and freedom written into the Chinese national constitution. You have 30 seconds, Mr. Lau. And a major you part... You have 30 seconds to answer that. <laughs> yes. Uh, is the young lady thrilled with her questioning? Well, everybody's going to be through unless you hurry. The answer is very simple. The fact that Taiwan has been able to grow at an annual growth rate of uh, better than 10 percent, the fact that we welcome 500, 520,000 visitors a, a year to Taiwan, that, that, that people enjoy a prosperous living standard, second only to that of Japan in Asia. Do you think that would be possible if there is all what you think is <laughs> as, uh, all Thank that kind of suppression Thank you, and lack Lowe. of uh, constitution freedom. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen of the panel. Thank you very much. printed copy of this program, send 25 cents to Firing Line, Post Office Box 5966, Columbia, South Carolina, 29205. That address again, Firing Line, Post Office Box 5966, Columbia, South Carolina, 29205. This program was made possible by a grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.